now let's uh, shift gears into the HER2 positive uh, subtype. And this clearly is an area where a lot of advances, both in terms of practice changing as well as understanding the biology have happened. Uh, but in terms of, of clinical practice, believe it or not, here we are uh, after uh, using HER2 targeted therapies for so long, and there's still controversy about the testing. Uh, we, we still have patients, uh, hopefully fewer now with the amended guidelines that are in this borderline uh, and then we're also the issue of tumor heter heterogeneity that the group at the Farber has, has reported on. Uh, so Adam, why don't you just very briefly give, a, give us a recap of the critical issues of HER2 testing. Yeah, it's just very sobering that 20 years, I mean literally it's been 20 <laughs> years, so 21 years if I'm not mistaken when we all went to Orlando and saw and those of us, some of us in the room were old enough. You know, have gone to that meeting in Orlando when they presented the data. I think we were all at that meeting in Orlando <laughs> when they presented the data. It's been 20 years since 21 years since they did that, and we're still arguing about what the proper test for response is. And I think that it's gone back and forth, but I think the ACP ASCO guidelines I think are probably reasonable now that we're settling on. Just to recap them, you know, if you have a copy number uh, for HER2 by uh, uh, Fish um, that of greater than six, six or greater, you're considered positive. Uh, four or under, you're considered negative. In between, you're obviously considered equivocal. But now the equivocals are being adjudicated now, obviously. So they're being adjudicated with copy numbers, so, I mean, with, uh, with ratio. So if you have a, uh, a ratio uh, of less than two in an intermediate range, you're considered to be negative. So I think that's a very reasonable way of doing it. And in our institution, I think as most institutions do this, you know, if you're three plus, we don't do the fish. If you are uh, two plus, we then uh, reflex you to fish and then go through this whole you know, copy number, copy number plus ratio. Um, and again, trying to really try to eliminate the equivocals. I think that that's been the problem for the last 10 years or so. And I think that, um, you know, Ian and the Farber, I think part of it may be have to do the heterogeneity. If you don't happen to count the right spot, you know, you know and a, a clearly at least our pathologists know to try to count the spot that has the most enriched area you know, when they look at a specimen. I think most pathologists think of it that way as well. I'm curious to see what other people do with their institute. Yeah, I, I, I would just add that, you know, for the, there's also the equivocal based on uh, a copy, the HER2 copy number. Right. And so uh, that now is adjudicated by IHC. So it's really a, uh, you know, you have to use both. The pathologist clearly has to be involved. And then about heterogeneity, I think it's important for it to be documented. We don't know how to quite use that data. Yeah, how do you it document heterogeneity? Later. But, yeah, but, but there are right. ASCO cap guidelines actually to define uh, heterogeneity and whether or not those are the best ones or not. But I think it is important to, to document that. Uh, we do have probably crude tools at this point, not as elegant as the ones that have been used in the lab, but um, uh, we need to do that. Uh, right. But in the end, just one ahead. thing. I mean, I, I just think that uh, I completely agree with you that these new guidelines have been really helpful at giving, you know, clear-cut guidance on what is positive and what is negative, and that all the equivocal uh, patients who were, you know, came out of based on the 2013 guidelines that we really didn't know what to do with, and we were people were sending, you know, other centromeric probes, right, the, which, you right. know, I think these new guidelines say you should not be doing that. It gives you clear-cut guidance on what to do. You do need your pathologist to be, you know, well-versed in this, uh, and it does include both IHC and FISH for the, you know, for the ambiguous ones, but at the end, you have a yes-no answer. Now, but now it's biology is not yes no. Right. We're not in a yes no. Well, I think it's, it's not yes, a yes no thing. Well, but it, I think it is yes no for you know for trastuzumab um, at least so far what we've seen. But I think as these new drugs come out, as we'll talk about later, uh, you know what you know th th that it may not be so clear cut. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the heterogeneity question, which right now we're still not sure what to do with. Uh, we, you know, we did have a, a study that showed very clearly that in patients treated neoadjuvantly with TDM1 and pertuzumab, that heterogeneous cancers do not do as well as those that are homogeneous. Uh, we are now going back and trying to, uh, you know, define with more granularity exactly how to define um, heterogeneity in a way that will be clinically useful. Um, but right now, it's you know it's not ready for prime. But time. I always ask this question: You would not treat someone with a ratio of 1.9, but you treat someone with a ratio of 2.1. Yeah. Well, like anything else, I guess you need cut points. But w w what has happened in, uh, very recently now is that another assay, which is the human patient bioassay, is, is now actionable. So we've been for years talking about responses in the neoadjuvant setting, what to do with residual disease, and both in triple negative and HER2 positive. 
uh, now we actually have actionable therapies. So Hope, do you want to review what's new and also some new insights from uh, uh, the neoadjuvant trials that actually guide therapy and are pointing to, to um, uh, uh, you know, uh, options that are actually now impacting mm -hmm. outcome? Yeah, I think it's been actually really interesting, and um, I actually think response in HER2 positive disease in the neoadjuvant setting has driven a lot of research in the neoadjuvant setting for other subtypes, because early on we saw that adding trastuzumab to chemotherapy in a really small MD Anderson trial resulted in high PCR rates, and those PCR rates translated into better outcome. And so then there have been lots and lots of trials, mostly not powered to look at event-free survival, that have shown that uh, different agents added in either improve PCR or don't. But it's been a real way to sort of test new drugs uh, in HER2-positive breast cancer and, of course, led to the initial approval, accelerated approval of pertuzumab uh, based on a really small neoadjuvant trial uh, looking at PCR and neosphere. Um, and, you know, that you could give neoadjuvant pertuzumab. We have learned that if you get a PCR, regardless of the way you get there, that your outcome is very good. Um, we've also learned that even though you get a PCR, you still have a small risk of getting CNS metastases, which is unfortunate, and this is an unmet need that maybe some of the new data we'll talk about will be able to uh, meet in the, or at least address in the future. Um, and then I think that we've also learned something about the um, heterogeneity in terms of ER and PR, because patients who have HER2-positive, ER-positive disease, not always, but often have a lower ratio and a lower copy number and less response to trastuzumab-based therapy. But in the adjuvant trials, they still did much better if they got trastuzumab. So PCR, again, in, even with HER2, for ER-positive disease is not the end all. But then we learned this next step. You know, we, we wanted to be able to change therapy based on response for early-stage disease and change outcome forever. And, you know, we go back to the Aberdeen trial where we just sort of changed around the chemo for everybody. You know, one size fits all. We didn't know enough. And obviously just changing chemo has never worked so far. But in our, the recent data from the Catherine trial, uh, which is so interesting, first of all, it's exactly what you would expect. You know, 70% of people had ER positive disease who failed to achieve a PCR. And then even so many people had little bits of residual disease, and then they randomized them to continue the trastuzumab or get TDM1. And of course, as we all know, the outcome was so much better in the TDM1-based uh, treatment group, which is uh, very interesting. A uh, little less than 20% got pertuzumab, but we don't really expect, based on the adjuvant data we'll talk about in a moment, for that to really change what we would do. And then we also learned from the Christine trial uh, that if you gave TDM1 with pertuzumab, which probably doesn't add much to TDM1 as far as we know, versus a standard TCHP regimen, that your PCRs were higher with the standard chemo. But if you got a PCR with TDM1, you did really well. So that there's a differential now in what you get preoperatively uh, being able to help with your prognosis and determining the next steps of therapy. And of course, this is now going to be tested in a uh, cooperative group trial as well as others where there will be some uh, variation in treatment based on response and a way to de-escalate as well as escalate.